Today's talk, inshallah, is meant to be thought-provoking. So stay with me, inshallah. We begin with a very simple ayah in the Quran. Allah says in the Quran, وَمَا مِن دَابَّةٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا طَائِرٍ يَطِيرُ بِجَنَاحَيْهِ إِلَّا أُمَنْ أَمْثَالُكُمْ مَا فَرَّطْنَا فِي الْكِتَابِ مِنْ شَيْءٍ There is not a single beast on earth, nor is there any bird flying in the air, except that Allah Azza wa Jal is aware of it and it is written in the book. Nothing has been left out of this book. Allah's rizq is a give, being given to this animal and Allah will take care of it. We haven't left anything out of this book. From this ayah, some ulama have discussed in our times especially this notion of animals in Islam. Allah mentions animals multiple times in the Quran. We have surahs named after animals. Surah An-Nahl, we have it. What other surah? Surah Al-Ankabut, we have it as well, right? And we have which other surah? Surah Al-Baqarah, we have, right? Surah Al-Fil. So we have all of these concepts of animals mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah. So the question arises, does our Sharia say anything about animals and animal rights? And that is a very, very interesting question. And many books have been written in the last 30, 40, 50 years. In fact, I did a quick Google search today to find books in Arabic and English. I found, no exaggeration, at least two dozen books written in the last 30, 40 years. Different titles, animal rights in Islam, this and that. PhD is done on this topic. And much can be said. I want to summarize some points before moving on to something different than the beginning topic. What we can say, for example, regarding animal rights, we can mention a number of points. Of them is that the Sharia has come with the commandment to treat animals with kindness, to not kill animals unnecessarily. So, for example, we have in the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that the lady who locked up a cat and didn't feed that cat, what happened to her? She was punished in Jahannam for killing an animal for no reason. We have in the hadith that the lady who lived an evil lifestyle, but she was kind to a dog, and she gave a dog water, that Allah forgave her entire life of sins because of that kind treatment she gave to that dog. And our Prophet ﷺ said that if any animal that's walking past your garden takes something, you will get an ajr for that, eating from that. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, we will get ajr for baha'im, for animals. And the Prophet ﷺ said, yes, everything that has a liver, meaning everything that has a heart, the Arabs say liver for the heart, everything that has a heart, if you are kind to it, you will get an ajr for that. These are in our traditions as well. In fact, we are told explicitly that an animal should not be killed for no reason. And we went over many weeks ago or months ago, right over here, I gave a whole talk about uh, in hadith in Sahih Bukhari, our Prophet ﷺ said, an ant bit one, of, bit one of the previous prophets, right? And the Prophet got so irritated, he doesn't mention the name, the Prophet got so irritated, what did he do? Remember, we gave this lecture here. He burned the entire colony of ants. And Allah said, because of one ant, you could have snapped, that's no problem, smack the ant, kill the ant, it's biting you, okay, you have the right to kill that one ant. But because of that one ant, you destroyed an entire nation of ants, this was not allowed to do. So the default is that we have to protect an animal. We have as well uh, the issue of the Prophet ﷺ forbade using animals as target practice. This is a hadith, la'natullah, if you use a live animal as tar target practice. What happens in Spain when you kill animals for entertainment? This is Allah's la'na is there. And our Prophet ﷺ forbade using animals to fight one another for entertainment. Again, this is done around the world. We have a hadith in this regard. Of the things as well we can mention is that explicitly the Sharia has come commanding people to not overburden animals with work. Famous hadith in the seerah, famous hadith, our Prophet was invited into a garden to eat some food and whatnot. And he's sitting down and a camel comes and starts crying in front of him. Famous hadith in uh, seerah books and Bukhari and others. And it starts making the noises of a camel, grunting of a camel. And our Prophet pats the camel, hugs the camel. And then he says, where's the owner of the camel? He said, Ya Rasulullah, I am the owner. He said, the camel has complained to me that you beat it and you overwork it and you do not feed it. Fear Allah with regards to these creatures who cannot express themselves. He literally said, Ittaqullah fil baha'im. Fear Allah with regards to the creatures who cannot express their pain. He came to me, Allah allowed me to understand, I am telling you to fear Allah with regards to these animals. We also have explicit ahadith 
about not mutilating animals. In fact, this is in the Quran. Shaytan says, I'm going to misguide mankind. I'm going to cause them to slice the ears of the, uh, of the camels, of the uh, cattle. This was how they would mark the animal. They would mutilate in a very vulgar manner the ear. And our Prophet ﷺ cursed the one who brands an animal in the face. If you must brand, you brand at the back so that your name is there. You don't put it in the face. This is extra adab for no reason. So we have all of these hadith as well. In fact, interestingly enough, we even have a hadith about perfecting the slaughter of animals. Famous hadith in Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Muslim Imam Ahmad, our Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has written ihsan, perfection, in all that you do. Even when you kill and slaughter animals, Allah has written perfection. This is a hadith. So when you slaughter an animal, sharpen the blade and give comfort to the creature. This is a hadith. When you slaughter the animal, even then, practice ihsan. Make the blade sharp. Give the animal some food and drink. Take the animal away from the other animal. Don't slaughter one animal in front of another. And all of these ahkam are in the sharia. And I have always wanted to give a very long lecture about animal rights and no exaggeration. If I were to give such a lecture, very easily we can spend maybe two or three hours or I can even give one detailed lecture. Maybe one day, inshallah, next year we'll have an animal rights lecture in Islam. But I actually wanted to use this as a segue for another topic. This was just a brief introduction to a much deeper topic that I hope inshallah ta'ala you will uh, contemplate over. I said there's 15, 20, 30 books written about animal rights in Islam. But all of them have been written in the last two, three decades. As far as I'm aware, no book has been written in early Islam, Kitab of the Adab of the Hayawanat. Hukuq al Hayawanat fil Islam, animal rights in Islam. In fact, you hardly find mention of this topic in detail in the books of fiqh, in the books of aqidah. Yes, you find, you call them isharat, you find little bits here and there. Imam al-Bukhari has a book, Kitab al-Adab. It's like a 600-page book. At the very end, one or two little chapter headings about uh, not having animals fight one another, for example. Kitab al-Tahrish, whatever, in animals. Very small things. You don't really find classical ulama uh, talking about this in a lot of detail. Some of you will say, didn't Al-Jahid write Kitab al-Hayawan? He did write a six-volume book, Kitab al-Hayawan, but it's not about animal rights. So you can just look it up what it is. So the point is, where did this topic come from? Why are the modern thinkers and writers writing so many books, PhD dissertations, on Hukuq al-Hayawanat fil-Islam? The response, we all know why. And that is, it's a modern discourse. A thousand years ago, people weren't talking about animal rights the way we do now. Animal rights is a modern topic. And there are societies that are dedicated to animal rights in, this, in, in the world, right? In this country, there's laws. 200 years ago, Western countries began for the first time instituting laws. You can go to jail in any or most countries in the world if you torture an animal for no reason. Right? These types of laws did not exist for the bulk of mankind. Even in our sharia, one can say that there is no law per se. If you were to mistreat, the adab is from Allah, not from the government. Right? If you were to mistreat when the lady mistreated the cat, right? the adab is going to come from Allah. Generally speaking, books of fiqh don't have animal rights. So, here's the question. Is it correct for us as Muslims to discuss animal rights in Islam? Is this a problem? Because we are discussing it and it wasn't discussed in the past? Should we not talk about it? Because we don't find our classical ulama talking about it the way that we currently discuss it? Or is this a strength of the religion? That in every time and every place and every discourse, we have something to contribute as well. You see, I'm using a very quick animal rights to get to a much bigger topic. Far more controversial, but we're not going to go there with the controversy. Today, we're going to lay the foundations for you to think about. Because what we have, brothers and sisters, is not just animal rights. We have a million and one issues that are new in our times. Human rights, living in secular democracies, liberalism, democracy itself, feminism, gender roles. All of these new ideas have come. And they are not found in the classical past. There are no books about freedom of speech in Islam a thousand years ago. So what is one to do? We have two extremes as usual. And as usual, I always say we should stick with the middle. 
The one extreme is we absorb these new discourses that are found outside of our tradition. Fact of the matter, animal rights as a discourse, as a, as a, as a discipline, as a set of values and ethics, fact of the matter is that it was taken as a separate discipline by the Western world. 300 years ago, people began talking about 200 years ago, the RSCPA, whatever, the British Society was one of the first, was it 1700, 1800, laws began formulated. It happened in this part of the world. And so our ulama in the last 50 years have then reacted, this is what we believe as well. The fact that this discourse began in the West, does it mean that anybody who then takes on this idea of animal rights in Islam, and tries to expound and write books and PhDs and entire volumes, does it mean that they have an inferiority complex? Does it mean that they've done something wrong? Does it mean they're watering the religion down because they have left the classical tradition? We don't find our great fuqaha having discourses about animal rights. Or does it mean our great fuqaha were indeed great fuqaha, but they are reacting to their time. And we should react to our time. See, this is the paradigm. This is the ideas I want to put into you because it is dangerous, I'll be the first to say. So on the one hand, we have one extreme. And what is that extreme? Whatever comes from outside must be positive. We have to find evidences in Islam to support it. So if they have their version of human rights, well then our sharia must have the exact same version. If they have their version of freedom of speech, they have their version of liberalism, they have ver their version of femininity and feminism, then we have to find exactly within our tradition and justify and distort and follow hook, line and sinker. And we have people like this. Whatever we find in the outer, outer side of our Islamic tradition, you will find people within us trying to say, no, no, this is exactly Islam. This is exactly what Islam says. And this is wrong. And I have criticized them in my entire life. I've been a very huge critic of, they call themselves the progressive movement. I've been a critic of that movement. They don't have a backbone. They're simply following whatever comes from outside and they take it in. But we also have the other side, brothers and sisters, and the fact of the matter, that other side is more common in the conservative circles. We interact with that side more. Most of us don't interact with the progressive sides because they don't come to our gatherings. They don't come to the masajid regularly. But what we do have is the flip opposite. What is the flip opposite? The flip opposite is to shut down your mind to any discourse related to this topic. To automatically say, no, no, no. The Sharia doesn't have anything to do with animal rights. This is bid'ah to talk about animal rights because our classical ulama did not talk about it. It is watering the religion down. You are a reformist that sold yourself to the highest bidder. You are importing the ideas of Quran. Subhanallah. Just because they're scared of one extreme, they find refuge in the other extreme. And they shut down any positive discourse about a new topic. And of course, this is wrong. And honestly, if they continue this way, Honestly, it will har har harm the religion of Islam and the flourishing of the religion of Islam. Actually, much can be said. I just want to point out one thing. Those who say, oh, we have to stick to the tradition. Our classical ulama did not talk about it. With utmost respect to them, they are not aware that the classical ulama themselves were reacting to ideas and concepts outside of the tradition. And that's why they debated so many things and it became what you think is the tradition. Do you understand what I'm saying here? That's exactly what they did in the past. And they did what they're supposed to do. Just because they came 500 years ago, a thousand years ago, does not make them khalas. We cannot do anything after them. So, give you a simple example and I have many more advanced lectures online. If you look at any book of Islamic aqidah, Islamic theology, the bulk of what you find in a classical textbook is actually because of controversies that happen outside of Islam. And we had to respond to those controversies. We had to think, what does the Quran and Sunnah say about this controversy? We had to extrapolate. The Sahaba never debated the reality of Allah's names and attributes, for example. Yet every group has to spend thousands of pages discussing Allah's names and attributes. The Sahaba never extrapolated the types of Qadr. But every book of Aqidah has types of Qadr in it. The Sahaba never talked about, is the Quran created, uncreated? But when Muslims conquered uh, Christian lands and the Christians were discussing the nature of Jesus, the nature of Logos, is the Logos created, uncreated? This was a controversy outside of Islam. 
And when the Muslims came across them, so then these questions were imported into Islam. And Muslims had to discuss, is the Quran created or uncreated? How do we understand the attributes of Allah? Because the Christians were discussing it, not because the Sahaba were discussing it. That's the way the world is. And so what this traditional person says, we have to follow the tradition, what he doesn't understand, that's exactly what the tradition is. It actually interacted with the broader world, and it defended Islam against the broader world. That's what the tradition is. Now, those controversies of the past have gone. We now have new controversies. And Islam must be defended against these controversies. And the way that it will be defended, we have to go back to the Quran and Sunnah. We have to go back to our sources. And we have to use our tried and tested tools. And we have to bring forth a new discourse, even if our classic ulama, ulama did not talk about it. This is not, astaghfirullah, dissing them. It's not disrespecting them. It is honoring them because they did it for their time. We appreciate their methodology. We must do it for our time. So, the one extreme, we follow hook, line, and sink, or whatever the outside world says. They have human rights, whatever they say, or we have the same human rights. They have their freedom of speech, whatever they say, we have the same freedom of speech. They have their morality, sexuality, gender issues, feminism, we have the same thing. No, we have something to stand on. But then we cannot fall to the opposite extreme, which is unfortunately another problem. And that is to say, oh, there's no such thing as democracy. There is no, no, because our scholars didn't mention. Subhanallah, go back to the Quran and Sunnah. See what can be done. Is there a version of democracy that can be Islamic? I'm just saying, I'm not going to give the lecture here. But that discussion has to happen, right? There's no such thing as human rights because our Sharia doesn't have the term حقوق insan. Yeah, it doesn't. I agree with you. But that doesn't mean we don't have any rights. I just gave you simple examples of animal rights. Just because our scholars didn't call it animal rights, it doesn't negate our process. And I said, don't torture animals. He said, treat them with dignity. He said, so we can extract an entire new topic called animal rights in Islam. We're not reinventing the Sharia. Ah. And we can benefit from outside ideas. And we can see what does our Sharia ah actually say. And we have to be careful because yes, it is a dangerous discourse. I'll be the first to say that. But we cannot just remain isolationist and say, just because they're talking about animal rights, we cannot talk about it because our tradition doesn't talk about it. Just because they're talking about modernity, about citizenship, about living in a democracy, about all of these issues, we cannot talk about it. No, we cannot retreat to the familiar of the past because that's not going to protect our children in the future. Now, I'm going to be the first to say, whoever does this, without a doubt, you're going to make some mistakes. We're going to have to be understanding and allow some mistakes to happen because you can't reinvent the wheel all of, all of a sudden. You cannot just do this automatically. But collectively, we have to support such people. Realize that the only way Islam is going to flourish is when we provide the broader world an alternative to, to their version. When we say, look, your version of human rights, your version of animal rights, the, we agree with 80%, 70%, but we disagree with 30%. And we bring why we disagree. And we show evidence-based. So, for example, for example, some extreme versions of animal rights, they equate animals and man as the same level of dignity and respect. And so because of this, they go to veganism, for example, right? They say it's unethical to kill animals because animals have the same sanctity as human life. And we say you have gone to an extreme. Agree, you treat animals with dignity. Agree, you don't torture unnecessarily. But at the same time, Allah explicitly says, Sakhara lakum. Allah has made animals, you know, subjugated to you. There is a hierarchy. And we are above animals in that hierarchy. This gives us the right to ride them, to have, you know, a, a benefit with them, to even eat them. But we bring in the Sharia and we say, even when we ride, even when we benefit from them, even when we slaughter, Ihsan is present there. And we bring forth a new discourse, Islamic animal rights. It's not going to be Western, but it's also not going to be something our classical ulama did. And we're not doing anything wrong when we do so. Now, I gave a non-controversial example, animal rights, but the reality was today's lecture wasn't meant for animal rights. It was meant for us to understand that the world we live in is radically different than the world of 7th century Baghdad, than the world of the Ayyubids and the Abbasids. And you're going to have to, if you want Islam to flourish 100 years from now, we don't have now 
an Islamic khilafah, we don't have the land, we don't have anything. And not just this, subhanAllah, the, the, the methodology of living in our times, the nation states, the liberal democracies we live in, you're not going to find Ibn Taymiyyah commenting on citizenship in America. So these types of discourses, you're going to have to have people think outside the box. They might get, they're going to make some mistakes. But unless and until we have such ulama, forward thinkers, What's going to be the, the alternative? Just go back to the past and not confront the future? So, to conclude, just because our past tradition doesn't have certain topics, doesn't mean it's wrong to discuss them. What is, not, what is important is not the label, Islamic animal rights. What is important is the content. What did Allah say? What did the Prophet ﷺ say? Can we bring forth a discourse, even if our classical ulama did not? Can we bring forth a new conversation? And as I gave you an example of the animal rights, not only can, we must and we should. And not only that, we make Islam something to be proud of. That's the beauty of our faith. It's meant for every time and place. It's meant to solve mankind's problems. It's meant to address us right here in America in the 21st, 22nd century. It, mu it must be eternal. How will it be eternal if we refuse to bring Islam onto the table and discuss it in light of modern controversies? How can we bring forth Islamic solutions if we're always going to go back to the past a thousand years ago when somebody said something not relevant to us. That's why brothers and sisters, ummat and wasatan, follow the middle path, follow those people, inshallah, connected to the tradition, but also trying to bring forth Islam to protect our children and grandchildren. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to that which He loves. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be instruments of khair and good. May Allah azza wa jal allow us to be hadi and mahdiya, and we seek Allah's refuge from being misguided and misguiding others. Jazakumullah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَمَلَائِكَتَهُ يُصَلُّونَ عَلَى النَّبِيِّ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا صَلُّوا عَلَيْهِ وَسَلِّمُوا تَسْلِيمًا إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَأَعَدَّ لَهُمْ عَذَابًا مُهِيناً وَالَّذِينَ يُؤْذُونَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ بِغَيْرِ مَا اكْتَسَبُوا فَقَدِ احْتَمَلُوا بُهْتَانًا وَإِثْمًا مُبِيناً